Yeah, and this was the issue that when I when it was sure it seems like he created problems for translate for the translation market because both in this and in uh, Ghost in the Shell they have single issues. I, I don't think actually Ghost in the Shell I think they took it out, but in this it's like this is the one adults only uh, mature readers issue that came out. And luckily, my comic store at the time when I was when I was sixteen, uh, Wonder World Comics in in near Seattle. You're gonna they, get that. What's the statute on limitations for selling pornography to a minor? I don't, it was don't, necessary. I needed don't that. Don't out them, Brandon. <laughs> I can't imagine the psychological damage. Oh, they don't exist anymore. But I can't imagine the psychological <laughs> damage it would have been if this was the one issue of Appleseed I wasn't able to buy. Oh God! If you couldn't get this whole story, yeah. Um, and here in in the sauna, you see that Dunin's reading, and she's she's reading waterproof book series, the Green Sahara Project. Um, so you do see that she is a studier and a reader, and right. that's where I was like, okay, okay, that was planned. Uh, but I wonder this what is her a... ankle and wrist things are there. Um, uh, I don't know. Maybe like for blood flow in the sauna, hmm. like a compression cuff, or did she hurt her ankle previous? She might. I don't know. They look like sweatbands to me. Yeah, it's interesting. She has them on all of her limbs. Or maybe it's some kind of training thing, like she's putting little five-pound weights on, <laughs> even when she's relaxing. That's right. Even reading Dragon Ball, right? And then those they have, he wears like the incredibly heavy shoes and wristbands, so he's so he fights better with them off. Yeah, and they do have those things that you can put on, and they do look like that. And it's kind of she's saying you look absolutely exhausted. And here I thought you were the effortless heroine. But like that's part of how you'd be an effortless heroine is like when you're doing your day to day activities, you make everything heavier. <laughs> sure. Maybe it's my guess. But um, I, I think also importantly in here, they they talk about Dunin's background as that she's half black or her mom was half black and she right. calls herself Cafe Olay, you know, that she she was mixed. So then all of that stuff about like her her inbuilt bias against blacks. And then you tell me Briar Rose is also a, a black Russian that, that just makes it even more interesting because that is part of her cultural heritage, but part, part of her a genetic heritage, but it doesn't sound like it's much part of her cultural heritage. Right. But then she has the thing where her mom was killed by, by black extremists for, cause they accused her. She was mulatto or something. And they accused her of being acting too white. Yeah, yeah. So like she's had a really complex experience with these these racial things um, in, a, in a really strange way where, yeah, she has like these pre-built biases against her own lineage because of cultural and life experiences. It's, it, it's interesting. And he does make a big deal about showing her footland with that little brace on, doesn't he? Huh. <laughs> I hadn't noticed those. Oh, here's here. We're really getting into the shower scene. Right, and here's the scene where we're getting the dramatic uh, death of her mother by murder while, yeah, while <laughs> the screen-toned ass shots. Yeah, yeah. Like a this is here. another one where I'm thinking Sigourney Weaver, you know, he had he had a, a type that came from the 80s movies for sure. Yeah, yeah, it's always fun. I, could, I, I think I mentioned Adam Hughes before too because there's this kind of bodybuilder kind of uh, uh, triangle shape uh body that you see a couple artists really uh lean towards that isn't really something that you're kind of used to seeing sexualized yeah and some of it like he some some of these shots like her back and everything look more reference to me he he goes into a different mode of like hatching that's mm -hmm. like like here versus here there's just a certain level of realism that suggests referencing versus some of the more made up looking stuff to me yeah i think so um, but they keep they go in here to the, again to the theme while they're in the shower. Uh, she's talking about an FBI report. Crime was inextricably, inextricably linked with society, impossible to suppress completely. And then Hatomi says that's why we need uh, Olympus. Is that like this is this other like little place where we can control and have a utopia while everything else goes to shit around us? I guess is what they're saying. Right. And then we have a just bend over to try and find your towel for no reason. <laughs> <laughs> That's really the top of her butt is the cross hatching on there is, is feels kind of, those are strange lines to me. 
that's why I think like this stuff looks a little more referenced because it's it he's just trading form in a different way in some of these yeah. shots and and it, it's outside of the way he normally works so you get some more awkward moments yeah, and it's funny because something he talks about in his intro on depot art book is the idea of how sometimes he got frustrated with how his faces seem 2d and his body seem more 3d and it really stands out in this in this type of stuff yeah that makes that that makes a lot of sense actually there's one painting he did where you see him draw this kind of dunan style woman with like a, a not a not an anime nose and it's really interesting to see oh yeah you'll have to send me that one that would be very weird to see him do not an anime nose um he goes back to the heritage thing here too but he he it's weird cuz he does talk about it as blood doesn't your african blood make a virtue of large families um the, so i think that's where we need to start like societally separating out like it's not a genetic thing it is a cultural thing hmm. uh but then i like i said earlier i think society has leaned too far into the cultural thing but yeah what is like strange comment where it's talking about okay some some societies gonna want large families and other ones are naturally gonna encourage like that that's inborn somehow is a, a sure. pretty strange thought here oh he really likes some greased up <laughs> <laughs> and then they continue to have this conversation basically about genetic diversity uh so close close race is a key to silent consensus the only way to create a culture of agreement outstanding technology and almost abnormal peace so she's saying like i i wouldn't say racial but like cultural consensus is needed to create mm -hmm. agreement um but then she says but we don't want it to be too closed so that's why we got to bring people in because we don't want it to get stagnant and that it's it is strange that they're having the core theme discussion of the book for the first time while they're getting oiled up Right. And uh, and I think that's Doris giving one of the massages there and they just don't recognize her with it without a wig on. Yeah, yeah. And that that gets strange again. But yeah, she definitely comes in and is like trying to get because she's looking at the thing on the neck. Right. Which is what mm -hmm. she's trying been trying to get back the whole time. But that's now a fake one. It's like right. a Trojan horse. And the other lady's like, you could have cut your I found a thing you could have cut yourself on and just throws it away. Yeah, and then probably went back and got it later if <laughs> she's trying to get I don't know, but yeah, I'm pretty sure that's the Doric lady. Yeah, I like that Briar Rose scene. He's reading what particles and fields, and then there's like a single raindrop before it, it starts raining incredibly heavily. Yeah, and that's that's more of showing that they're both scholarly and reading a lot. Mm -hmm. And I also think um that's probably since he's talking about particles and fields, that's probably where he's getting some of that waveform stuff from uh, that light could be both a both a particle and and a wave yeah um, sure is not the only would... artist that will put seemingly what his reference for what he's writing of in the book is the characters holding it yeah so i'm i'm pretty sure that's where some of that stuff is coming from earlier um and then yeah it, it he probably is trying to make some point by having it rain right after that too i don't know what it would be but yeah almost like will eisner-esque handling of rain for a second yeah, here which is really cool and i think in the next beautiful. one it's a, like an arabic robot talking about how the value of water is different in a place that rains this much yeah which is exactly then he's tying to like a lot of ethnic values are just based on the physical environment that you grew up in right mm -hmm. bunch of notes <laughs> right and i think this is essentially like a is he like a, a Muslim scientist making a giant robot to create problems for people? Yeah, this is part of the, yeah, there's a Islamic. Islamic, right. An Islamic. But like, he, I think he's pretty right about what the major forces would be, you know, 30, 40 years from when he did this is that mm -hmm. you kind of have like China, Japan, the United States, Russia and the, and the Islamic world um still battling each other out this is now the rain's over and that whole city's like sparkling and clean while it's like the drizzles it's kind of drizzling out talk about drawing weather uh-huh 
and right here too. Yeah, and he's got the great uh, Snake Plissken cameo on the bottom right. <laughs> yeah. Which I think I saw a version of this. It might have been a recent Japanese reprint where he redrew that as not Snake Plissken, which I felt like was a loss. Yeah, because this is of the time. Like you've you've got Sigourney Weaver, <laughs> Snake Plissken. And then here you do have um, the note pan Islamism. So you see that this this like Islamic world, and, and they even talk about, uh, I think it's in here. Yeah, the Islamic, the Muslim savior who's expected to um, create a united world. So there's mm -hmm. there it, while they're all trying to get their own utopia, there's all these battles about who's who gets which utopia. <laughs> you know, do you get the Islamic one? Do you get the Greek one? Yeah, and, and then the scene is sorry. What were we saying? No, go ahead. I was gonna say this scene is just her. Um like they're doing a training exercise and she's just being like, uh, like this is her area of expertise. So she's being like a little too aggressively competent and kind of uh, shaming her team. And she's made all these joke signs. She hangs around their, their necks when she beats them. Yeah. And when, it, and when you compare that to like, she's kind of been getting yelled at for being a SWAT person when they're trying to do an investigation. So she's probably feeling incompetent, which she's not used to. And uh, yeah, so it makes sense that she goes overboard. And then there's this scene where uh, Briar Rose basically scolds her. And you find out that like the human brain and the robot body is the more sensitive to the social conditions. And the, the pure human one is like this kind of autistic, like not quite socially competent person. Yeah, that, that shows the relationship really well. Um, yeah, I like him just sitting there with his arms crossed and he's like, He's like, these people aren't going to watch your back if you if you treat them like shit. Yeah. And he's like, I'm, I'm telling this because I love you and I'm worried about you. Then we go. They So then they all go out and get drinks together. And she seems to have apologized to them and a bit let into the group. Mm -hmm. Then Dork's husband shows up. Yeah, that's a strange scene. Like, Dorg is a, a confusing character in this book to me. But yeah, her husband shows up and then she comes in and everyone's looking at her and she's like, what? Yeah, this was another one of these, like, kind of reverse storytelling things where because that's all on this page and then the conversation kind of takes a different path here. This is like her and Briar Rose talking about like, hey, I apologize. Can you not hate me anymore? And oh, yeah, I love you and stuff. So you, you kind of move on from the husband and then you come back to it here. And even more strangely is she actually walks right past him. Like this is yeah. the husband here, um, but he's like smoking and slightly turned away. And then when I got here the first time I read it, I had kind of got engaged with this and forgot about this enough where I was like, what? The, I don't get why I don't get it. Um, mm -hmm. And I had to go back and then I got it. It's an interesting panel with Briar Rose entering the bar too. It's like really stylized how he's all in shadow. Well, and and they say, like, here comes our top one man team. So that's like the big doo -doo. like I can hear the soundtrack in the movie with that uh -huh. shot. Yeah, I like that thing of him. It's in, I guess it's a cop bar, but it, he's like got his shirt off and he's like cleaning himself with a towel in the middle of a bar. Oh, yeah. So he's not human up top, at least. Right. I yeah. No, when, they, when they show him. Uh, in the data book or whatever it's basically he's wearing like black speedos and everything else is robotic so he kept his junk and, and his brain <laughs> that's the important parts yeah the two brains i really like the um the high-waisted pants he always draws to unit in it goes right up to a rib cage on the right there well that's a super 80s thing i was actually talking to my students about that uh just the other day is they were they were making so much fun of low-waisted pants and i was like man you know just like when i was in school that was like what our moms wore yeah. was the high-waisted pants so we wore low-waisted pants and now the moms wear the low-waisted pants and so the kids are wearing the high-waisted pants again i i uh as an aside to me being old i went to disneyland the other day and there's a <laughs> new thing that i saw a bunch of people doing that was surprising to me where it was a bunch of girls that just have their pants unbuttoned and open Oh, I haven't seen that. To kind of recreate, uh, to, to kind of recreate like a low ride thing. And it was really surprising me because it was in Disneyland. Like one of the ladies, it was a woman, one of the people I saw, I saw two people with it. And one of the women had her kid with her 
And it just seemed really weird to have somebody's pants undone while holding like an infant. I was like, that's what yeah. got you in the problem. The the trend here in, in Alabama at the, at the university, at least, is that the girls wear really short shorts and then they'll wear like their dad's T-shirt. So it looks like they're only wearing a T-shirt. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah that's it's funny to me when you see the kids wearing the really high waisted pants because I do associate it with with moms and it just makes me think you see like a teenager dressed like that. And you're like, you nerd, what are you going to Costco? Yeah, like like that's what I was trying to explain to them is people our age, we called those mom jeans and yeah. you made fun of it. And now like mom jeans are the low, the low cut jeans and the tall waisted ones are the cool ones. Yeah. Uh, Lower back tattoos are now just for moms. Yeah. The uh as they say in Germany, ass antlers. <laughs> <laughs> it's a beautiful. Uh, Anyways, uh, this is another one of those drawings where because of what he's doing with the hatching, it almost looks like Kevin Nowlin came in and inked this one. I feel like he's looking at reference material. And when he's doing that, he's more likely to render three dimensional form. Yeah, he does. That. I, feel like, I think of that as like a girl's manga page layout where you have this giant image of the character that kind of is the most important thing on the page. But it's interesting that he uses it as like an establishing shot of the room and what and the character. It's like the it feels like the whole point of that page is like, this is her. This is the room she's in. Anyway, moving on to the story. Yeah, like here and here. Here's a bunch of people. And this is just them preparing to go into. Uh, this is now the mission that all these different agencies have been brought together for. I, I getting lost in all of the thematic stuff didn't really follow what they're trying to accomplish here can you describe that better uh essentially i think they're going to a they got the go ahead to go into a foreign country they're going to france they're going to france oh because france has nuclear weapons right and, and i think for this one they just are going to arrest this house full of a bunch of generals and uh and like generals from all over the world, they're all meeting up. And I think in the end, they get them for human trafficking. They have a bunch of um, like naked people in the basement. Yeah. And, and, but they're also concerned about like Olympus has taken most of the nuclear weapons. Oh, and right, yeah. France still has a nuclear reserve. So they're going in. I don't think to get the bombs exactly, but that's part right, of they're why. They're going in to get the. The people in charge, um, and this scene I think is another one that's really referential to. There's a British SAS movie called Who Dares Wins, and uh, there's a there's a SWAT scene in that movie that that feels like it was Shiro's main basis for the for the SWAT scene here. Okay, that would be it's, it's like really raining scary, and really it's scary. got one of these like modernized modern like uh, mod buildings or something in that movie. I think it's more just if I remember right, it's the inside of when they get in that building because. Um, okay. I haven't seen Who Dares Wins for a long time, but there's there's actually like some of the furniture from this scene, I think, is in that movie. Oh, okay. We'll we'll take a look once we get to those pages. Then. Yeah. Um, more really awesome weather. A really nice joke here. I, I would really love to have like Shiro's commentary on the current political situation because so much he's he's like already predicting it. Uh, well, not predicting it. I mean, it's always been this way, but you have the, sure. all these protesters outside. What is it? Hey, what's that? I don't know, but I'm against it. <laughs> yeah, that is great. <laughs> That's just another, like, his insight into humanity. Yeah, it reminds me of the Groucho Marx, whatever it is, I'm against it song. Yep. Um, and there's a great scene where, yeah, on that page, where it's the American Green Beret and he's reading a Playboy. <laughs> and I like the way that they sneak up and then shoot him through the car like that. Uh, and then also, like this is this is maybe an early instance of where his note making gets over the top. Is he makes a note and then he ends it with like the orc suits monitor acoustic signature AS, and then it's note and AS. So he had to make a note for his note. Yeah, yeah. Some of that is useful because I remember in one of the early books he talks about like hesh clips or like high explosive or like squash rounds or something, and so yeah. it's like. I gathered a bunch of information that I would never gotten by his his notes on notes. And I like the Briar Rose thing where he's got a camera in his ear too to look around the corner. Oh, right here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. That is super cool. And 
another one here quote that I like conflict between nations is used as an excuse to legitimize any time any crime it's time to put an end to borders so he's like this is another one of those things where it's like look one of the biggest problems we have as a species is tribalism and it doesn't matter if it's nationalism it doesn't matter if it's whatever Uh, identity group you sign up to like whatever if if you're thinking tribally you're causing problems Yeah, I think that's a good way. It's a great thing to say. So it's funny that he's saying that while grabbing somebody around the neck. yeah well and i mean he i think shiro is also showing like Yeah, we're trying to reach that, but we you constantly lose because you constantly have to use the tactics of the enemy, like militarism, to beat them. Oh, yeah. Oh, this is an incredibly fascinating panel in the middle of this page. We probably talked about this before. Um, the eye line uh, on the right below your finger, the the panel with all the characters. You see the little the the light part is like following the the Dunan's eye line as she looks around the room and then recognizes who has a gun before shooting. Oh yeah, we did talk about that, and I I hadn't I didn't notice that on the reread either. But you guys did point that out um, on the, on the lost video. Is Right. uh, that that is if you look up um, saccadic eye tracking, the way he renders this actually looks like the lines that they draw in the early eye motion studies when they were tracking the what's called saccadic motion of the eyes, the little bounces it does multiple times a second. um they'll show them a picture and then they can see where they look and this looks very much like that so if anyone doesn't know that look up alfred yarbus cicadic eye motion and i i would bet that he's looking at that It's such a cool thing to work into a comic. yeah it's really really smart um i i first heard about it because nick susanis used it in his book on flattening which is about comics and He has a panel that shows someone looking at Leonardo da Vinci's Mona Lisa and Uh-huh. all of the little pieces you would see. And then he puts them back together to kind of show what your brain's doing. It's picking up all these little pieces and then it's stitching them together in an image. Well, we'll have to read that book someday because that's that's like formalist heaven right there for me and you. Oh, yeah, we should do that and then go through the Scott McCloud and Will Eisner books. And Yeah, that'll be yeah. fun. And and Nick's working on his second book. I mean, he's been working on it for years, but um, when that comes out, maybe we'll try and get an interview with him too. Oh, that'd be great. Um, it's interesting. He's showing the cutaways of their faces underneath their masks too. So you can kind of see their facial expressions. Yeah, and that's that's something that uh it takes some adjustment on my part. Also, like I know he's putting symbols and stuff on the suits to help me, but they all kind of start looking the same. And then when they've got these things on their faces too, um, I'm just having to rely on the context of the dialogue for which characters which. I guess she's got dark eyes and lighter ones, but I have a little harder time tracking who's saying what. This is the furniture you're talking about. Uh, yeah, yeah. A lot of this stuff I think is in Who Dares Wins. He's got And the it's yin interesting. yang I think symbol. the, the guy with the weird big fern hair is an American uh, general. And he's got like this weird scar on his face or something too. Yeah, it's such strange character designs. It's like for how much he seems like he's pulling other characters. Like I know he he references actors a lot. So some of the people will just look like you can find a photo of an actor that looks like the the character. And then that guy, I don't know what um, five-star story on him or something he's pulled out of. That's like David Bowie from Labyrinth as the the Goblin King with his big hair like that and stuff. I don't Here's, know what here's the weird the Goblin text. King of America. Yeah, if he would have given him heterochromia, that would have been more <laughs> more David Bowie. I like the Yin Yang symbol. Oh, did he pull the action trick again? Yeah, he kind of has it speeding up down here. Where all the lines kick in. Yeah, it's, it is a it is a cool technique of having everything very calm and then you do the page turn and suddenly you're in the action and everything's moving fast. Yeah, and like how you pointed out, he's starting to put the action lines down here Mm -hmm. to go from the static. That is an interesting technique. I like the way the blood splats are on the middle panel when the guy's getting machine gunned. That's like feels like how um, Stephen Platt used to draw him too, like in when he was doing profit and stuff. I bet he was pulling that because some of the 
like weird kind of slightly clogged line work looks like someone was looking at this where as this is probably just clogged because of reproduction issues uh, i i think people saw it in print and then took that style because Stephen platt has that kind of clogged but exciting dynamic line splat splat and i love this dude jump jumping out uh, this is kind of a hard panel to look at because he's got overlap from here and then the main action is being blocked by this character, but he's jumping down a garbage chute and basically winds up in the sewer, a French sewer, which they are describing as so disgusting that they can smell it through all of the filtration systems in their suits. Yeah, I really like how he does the the lighting on that, the kind of the reflection from the water. Yeah. And w which probably really would have no light source, right? They're just in a tunnel underground, but it for clarity's sake it really works yeah yeah another thing he talks about in his art book is like he'll have a, a drawing of all the characters in camouflage and they he apologizes that he's had to draw the characters so you can actually see them because if he did actual camouflage it would just look like a forest <laughs> he's like i can't give them actual camouflage <laughs> like i can't trust you to find them in there right Das ist für dich. So that's obviously like that's someone on the team that's uh, German, right? Yeah, I could think it's it's characters from all over the of the world on their SWAT team. Yeah, and and this is Russian. Name. Someone speaking Spanish here. It's a cool carpet. And this one. I like this guy's design here. Oh yeah, and he oh. starts putting these crazy googly eyes on the on their masks sometimes, which is really strange looking to me. Yeah, it is. It is interesting. It gives him such a different face. Um, yeah, I think we're getting to the scene where uh, they have a hostages in the the couple of <laughs> um, a couple of cyborgs have hostages and a bunch of explosives, and they send in Briar Rose to take him out. Yeah, and this is another one. Um, that the image right away didn't make sense to me until I started really reading the whole scene. I, I thought at first that it was a joke because you have this character putting these explosives up, um, but it says front towards enemy, but they're facing towards themselves, which looks really yeah. dangerous. But then you realize this because he never shows the hostages. I don't think you realize that the suggestion is there's a bunch of hostages back here. Oh, and I they're going to see them eventually. But yeah. And I feel like, I feel like that, that cyborg looks especially French too. It's like a Cirque du Soleil cyborg. <laughs> I would love to see Cirque du Soleil do a sci-fi. Have you gone to a Cirque du Soleil show in Vegas? I haven't. I've seen them on video. I should actually go uh, in Vegas because I'm here. I love watching the videos of that stuff. It would be so cool to see him do sci-fi. Yeah. Um, and the cool thing is that the, um, the original issue release of this chapter was they had the covers done by Adam Warren. And so these these cyborg characters, you get to see him doing color versions of. Oh, uh, that would be cool. Purple for that character. Because you have a real cool one here and then this more like spiky, more effeminate looking one. Yeah. Yeah, and, and basically Briar Rose convinces one of them to come out and then like Dunan shoots it while he punches it and then plugs his brain into that person's brain before it <laughs> before it lands almost. Well, and they're they're like um, someone else is here, like trying to negotiate with them. And then Dunan steps up and is like, now she can be competent again. And she's like, I'll show you how to negotiate. And then she's just like. You're you're both going to die either way. And this is a black ops mission, so I don't give a shit about the hostages. And he's like, you're bluffing. And she's like, fucking try me. And you can count to three and then her her and briar rose have obviously like done this before where mm -hmm. they count to two and then he socks them and, and everyone else is like oh that was a dirty trick it's like what are you talking about no yeah and i think they're trying to get like they want briar rose to be dismantled because something they talk about a bit in the apple seed is that briar rose has got like the perfect brain to be a cyborg they call him like an octopus brain where he can with the right attachments he could like plug himself into an aircraft character and control it all and so they like they don't want to negotiate with him because he has an unfair advantage. Well, and also, um, like because because he's got that octopus brain, that means that he can constantly have these new add-ons, 
and they they have a name for it like i thought it was his last name but it's a model type that they refer to the uh Uh, Hectocrates. yeah that that is like a model type and they really want the parts from that because it sounds like they're going to put it on themselves so they're they're like that's part of their negotiations is let us take that guy apart and we'll give you <laughs> we'll give you the hostages and dunan's like no fuck that you're not taking my boyfriend and then then uh the other one comes out and this scene here is just so badass and this is where i see like his tracking on his storytelling gets a lot better um is he he throws he throws a a right hook and then he follows so he goes the one way and then he comes back the other way with the left roundhouse and then he goes back to um more like like a right hook again here and then a left cross so yeah, the back and some forth. brain out of their head yeah while also and and while also just being completely badass drawings Every yeah, step yeah. Of the way. um it looks like it looks like he's doing almost like fist the north star proportion proportions on the kick panel oh i love it i this this one is so cool to me yeah and it very fist the north star um and then something happens down here which i wasn't a hundred percent sure what he was drawing but I, I think the suggestion is they knock the thing over onto one of the mines and it blows up underneath them. But I don't know oh, what yeah, this that's what it looks like. I don't know someone's shooting or something here, but I, I think don't... it's Dionan because you see her face above and then she's shooting at. Oh, she's shooting this behind. OK, there's the little leggies under there, like the little yeah. tripod it's on. OK. Yeah, and it reminds me, they always call Briar as the point man is a big kind of like a nickname for him. And it might be that he's like the person who's like doing all of the, the upfront combat and then um, Dionan's kind of backing him up. Well, and yeah, you're sending in the robot with the tougher body mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah, the action scenes in this are like, I think that this um, this book, because I think I think book three is the one with the famous knife fight scene where he's getting like some of the best action scenes in, in comic book history. In this book? It might be book four. Yeah, there's a, there's like a 12 page knife fight scene that is. a. No, it's not in this book. one. Yeah, it's in the no. next book. That one is like, you know, that one shook the earth when it came out. Oh, well, I look forward to that. Um, and they show a lot more incompetence here, like with people stepping on things. Grab. He's like, I'm going to grab a sword. No, wait. And then he gets blown up. Um, so they kind oh, yeah. of show who's making bad decisions and who who's actually like really presently aware. And I think some of that's coming from they've got people on this team that are more used to investigative police work rather than SWAT work. Right. I love this this robot's design here. And this guy comes back a couple times in future books. This looks like um, a, a way better version of some of the designs I've seen in the Dragon Ball Z reading I've been doing, like the Cell character in Dragon Ball Z. Oh yeah, this looks like a way cooler version of that. That is a cooler Cell. <laughs> the yeah. the mouth on him is pretty. And this is a kind of a Cell face. I never made that connection. And he has this weird pot belly. And that weird, like black, white, black kind of articulated, obviously would make a good toy. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then some other very strange characters here that that are still in the basement trying to figure out how they're going to get out. Yeah, and here's the hostages that they were talking about. Yeah, and they they talk about him in a strange way where like he says um, must be swallows or body pack sources. If they were being raised for food, they wouldn't have slept with them. So I want to know like within that society what a swallow and a body pack source is. Uh, but Maybe then they also are... suggest that they're basically just they're just keeping these things to fuck them. Right. Or maybe drug mules. Body pack sources. OK, yeah. And someone who's swallowing. I think they do reference that because then he says, yeah, yeah, you're right, because he tells them to do a cavity search and look for bags of white powder. Right. And they also might be growing them for organs is another. Yeah, which I think is. The swallows is probably the meals. The body pack sources is probably yeah organ harvesting. Mm -hmm. It's all uh, all pretty dark, but uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. He does such cool stuff with environment too. Like um, it's really it's still surprising to me. Like he has he has so much cartoony manga in his stuff, and then when he shows like how well he shows like the rain and the lighting on things, it really he's really kind of like like trying out new things throughout this book 
Well, and I think that's uh, that's like where we all want to get to is where we're a great cartoonist and we can do all the realism and find the halfway point between it because that's like it's such an absorbing thing when you can give that much like atmosphere and texture, but then have the fluidity and like linguistic component of being a good cartoonist. Certainly, and the really cool way he's drawing the um, the the mesh on the the fence, the guys behind there, just like a couple lines and then a couple white line scratched over top yeah it's like an impl implication of it and then here briar rose the guy's holding on to it and briar or no that's is that dude yeah dunan punches him dunan punches and she's got the suit on so it sends him flying yeah and, he's and got then like he turns out to be a, a robot he's got like an android face so maybe that's why he has that weird x pattern because he's a robot underneath huh because like you can see all the stuff underneath on that panel. Yeah, it's interesting. And then they have to make up a fake story about how like he almost got her gun and they're like, you don't know how to hold on to your weapon. <laughs> the, that's just what they're telling to not get in trouble, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> the great panel of Briar Rose holding on to Junian. As she tries to go nuts, yeah. He's still her conscience. I think about that Doris panel a lot because there's a the line that goes over her chin. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's like if it's a little, is it like a see-through thing or I don't know. I think it's a cool effect. I think yeah, I think she's got like a see-through thing on her turtleneck. Yeah. And also his slight gradation he's using on the and this was all back like hand done screen tone where he were there, you know, they're putting down kind of clear plastic and then he was cutting it out with an exacto knife. Yeah, so he was center in like a gradient one, like specifically here. Mm -hmm. What like is this? What's this black stuff? Is that like a pattern on it? That's not shadow. It's a shadow. Huh. But it like over here it looks almost like she has a graphic on her shirt. Or in a, a cool graphic tee. <laughs> it's a dead Yeah, pool. it's a strange one. Um, and then here they go back into like the real thematic stuff. Um talking about it's tough to work with someone her age so they're talking about like societal differences based on age but we need components like her the odd piece out in the jigsaw puzzle the variable part a unit structured like a simple metallic crystal has no flexibility to respond to the unexpected so again talking about like if you have a perfectly unified society and of course while we get philosophical we got to throw in a um, tight bun shot but yeah, we're not animals but, here <laughs> yeah uh talking about that if you have too static or too unified of a system it can't be responsive anymore it's just dead it's just a rock and and right. so you need those um kind of outside agents a free agent in the system that has free will in some sense like th they kind of talk about the this whole next page is this idea of the hero inside of the system and, and and as someone in this in a predetermined system who has been predetermined to have free will which is something that it you know when i did my philosophy degree we talked about that a lot if free will versus determinism and oh. really the only out that i ever saw that anyone ever like made any sense is that you could have a deterministic system that has some agents programmed into it that aren't determined. And like that is their de predetermined function. And so he's kind of talking about that here that Dune in and a lot of these people that they're bringing in from the outside play that role for this utopia that they're trying yeah. to. Yeah, I guess that's the theme through all the books too, because just bringing in people from bad side to into the utopian society is creating this like diversity of, of uh of people in, in olympus yeah and and like he's thematically like this one i think he's really focused on the diversity aspect of it mm -hmm. more than in the other books that's the theme um and then also like at the end of it says like the the advice is but at the end of the day you just do your best and that's all anyone can ask the so she's saying i've got to get tougher sorry go oh, ahead yeah yeah <laughs> which is an interesting takeaway. But uh, the page on the right is thinking it's it 
it creates this effect with the trees that look like it's like almost kind of zooming in quickly on the top panel, which is interesting because it's such a static shot. Yeah, but he does have motion lines there. And these are much more static. That's a cool little motorcycle. Yeah. This feels very Akira Toriyama to me now that I've read some of the original Dragon Ball, just not Dragon Ball Z. This feels like something he would draw. And even the way the, the bikes are handled a bit Toriyama-ish. Yeah, yeah, imagine Toriyama in the 80s in Japan certainly cast a long, a long shadow. I always think of of Shiro as this like guy who's incredibly good at doing really cool fashions and things, and this is such a a weird Barbie outfit that she's in in this in this scene. But you've got like a number of different like this one's very also very unique. Yeah, and like then the strange hat on top of the Barbie outfit. I often think that that Shiro's a guy who doesn't necessarily have like a standard page that he does, but I'm I'm feeling like this what I called kind of a girl's style page of having the giant character on the left hand side on a more of establishing page it seems like something that he really likes to return to yeah he's done that a number of times for sure and then in this page here there's a big discussion about parthogenesis so a plant that self-replicates versus um sexed creatures that are able to create genetic diversity so that's mm -hmm. another one of those back to that theme and we don't need to go through and read it all but they bring back up the humanities um which i think is the society that this character's from like the african society right uh and then they use the term chocolate party like in quotes oh huh. <laughs> strange to me within the context of the rest of that stuff yeah yeah, it seems like he's certainly having fun with the art on that. It's like yeah, oh, and, discussion, and here's Hitomi just lying around in her in her leotard suit, reading introduction to molecular design. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, I guess that's what you got to do. Is like you're getting real serious. Like his answer to that is always, "I'm just going to draw sexy girls to make it visually interesting," while I get really boring and philosophical with the dialogue right um but they're also talking about that this cat chick from the first issue that then disappeared and seemed totally irrelevant to the rest of the yeah. story was actually supposed to be brought to olympus and be hitomi's new roommate huh like uh yeah quite a creature her hair changes She's a real wolf girl. She's supposed to be living here with me. Quite a creature. Her hair changes. The length changes according to her temperature. She's gone missing. She's got cat eyes and ears like a mule deer. Um, and then they're talking about her life process. She ages five times faster because something's gone wrong. And she's a clone. Or she can right, clone yeah. herself. And so I think in the future can... book, they are living together, which seems weird at this point in the story. Like, I think she's like baking muffins or something. Yeah, so like this thing that like messed a bunch of people up and they were like, okay, screw it, let it go. Now it comes back and it was like, oh, they were trying to bring her in and supposed to be Hitomi's roommate. And then you jump back to her. Uh, she has been brought into Olympus because originally they were tracking her in Central Park, right? In New York. Right, well, they brought her into Olympus and she crashed the ship that she was on. And then this is her escaping in to an Olympus. Oh, yeah okay she escaped um, and yeah and she's wakes up and she's like her fur is her her you know fur is grown all over her body well and they say in that that her hair will grow or shrink depending on like what the temperature is and humidity is yeah and there's a great scene where she catches a bug and then eats it and doesn't like it yeah and and he goes into his like chibi face right there which is awesome yeah the cat the catching the bug panel on the top right is such a cool uh unique way to show that like how fast she is. Yeah, that is a good, that's a really good one. Then we have more of his like static on the left and action lines on the right page. Yeah. And then we're bringing in some new mech suits here. Oh, yeah. They're gonna... I like the these ones a lot. And he's like, doesn't do a damn thing for your head or your balls. And it's got like <laughs> hey. on the crotch. 
and they're they're complaining quite a bit about the design of them throughout and then it almost kills one of the guys too um, yeah which is funny because it's such a cool maybe it's a thing <laughs> i wonder if it's shiro like designing this really cool thing and then being like but it wouldn't function that well even though it looks that cool and then showing it not functioning well yeah and like with some of the strange like animal legs and i i wonder if he's like picking up on a popular design style at the time that he thought was fucking stupid <laughs> i mean it's such a cool design and it looks so unique to him also and also i like that he's got the main character um or the, 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 this guy here that he keeps bringing up this whole thing is he's just like constantly hitting on women around him he's trying to get a date with this pretty lady who's putting them in the mech suits and she's like i don't have time for that i've got kids <laughs> There would be a guy doing that, though. There, there's always one in every class. Yeah. And then down here, he has a note. Um, and in, in the very first Appleseed video we did, we were talking about his architecture. And somebody, I apologize, it's been like three, four years now, mentioned uh, pa Paolo, oh, I forget the last name, but that there was an artist, architect, designer who had a series of books called Ar Arcology, and that he had a a philosophy of design card called arcology and that that seemed to be a huge influence on shiro and yeah. i looked at those images and i and i sent them to you and sean and we were all like oh yeah that definitely looks like it could be here he he uses that term explicitly he uh, it says under olympus has been reinforced to support the arcology blocks so he most definitely looked at that arcology book and was using that as um, not I don't I don't think just a visual basis, but a philosophical basis for designing a technological world that's integrated with a natural world, which is what that book is about from the the bits I was able to see and and okay. understand. That is cool. So good good call out, whoever called that out. I hope you're yeah, still watching. Really <laughs> yeah, I love how he draws nature in these. Yeah, I, that also makes me really excited to see Orion because I'm assuming there's more nature and less less. Uh, oh yeah, sci-fi city stuff in that one. Yeah, more like brick brick castles. Yeah, and then now you have these technologic like these people who have received the newest technological upgrade. Uh, they're already complaining about the design. They are now out in nature hunting a creature that's very competent in nature yeah and her outfit is, is her strange uh like uh goth club outfit that she's wearing in the jungle it, uh, this one i could see adam warren designing for some reason with that shiny top and the little loincloth i, I bet that was a huge influence on warren that's an interesting panel on the top left because it looks like they're they're kind of falling off the cliff but the robot or the ro suit he's in is so static that it kind of looks odd it looks like he's standing on it or sitting maybe. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then in this scene, you really get a lot of uh, what I wrote on the note as technique versus technology. So you have people mm -hmm. that are coming in and relying on their technology, but the technology you can see uh, it, it, like the guy gets knocked into the water and then the suit's not operating. Right. And so his helmet starts filling up and he's like drowning. Mm -hmm. And at the same time that the technology is failing, there's the one guy on the team who's not wearing the suit and, and he's just like out in nature like she is and then her and they're both using technique, uh, it, whereas right. the other people are stuck in the technology. The great cutaway of his hand inside of the robot suit too, on the left side there. Where is that? Saying? Right here. Yeah, it's like inside the his hand trying to move the thing. Oh, okay. I just thought that was mechanics. I see there's fingers up here now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's cool that he does panels sometimes that you don't, you can read it fine without knowing what the panel is. It's just like a beat that's important. Well, but then like for someone else looking more, because I'm, I'm reading more stories. So I go, okay, mechanics and I keep going, but you're slowing down and I like have studied the art on this a lot. Obviously, <laughs> this is something you've come back to many, many times. Oh, very much so, yeah. Yeah, uh, the, yeah. this jungle stuff is awesome. Poisoned. Yeah, this is such a... I, somewhere I have a... Um, I have saved some JPEGs that are... Somebody who did a did basically a fan comic of this scene. And it's really interesting to see another artist try to recreate these really Shiro movement 
panels. Like this one right here is so good. With all this weird like stuff being shot down at him. Yeah, and that's something that, that, that the way the action is done here is something you see a lot in kind of the Adam Moore and stuff of this era too. Like he was definitely sense. like yeah, yeah, definitely. I feel like Adam Warren is a good way to kind of um, parse out. It's it's almost like to 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 take Shiro stuff through another artist's um, ability, and then it kind of make it helps me understand the Shiro stuff more how it's done. So someone who's like a, a little less dense and a little more accessible, yeah, is exactly. like a, a good gateway drug. Yeah, and then we have like the crashing in now we're moving out of the nature and into the society and again we get like uh this this idea that people are just going to be sitting around and doing like arts and and stuff to some extent so we have like yeah. a whole painting class here and th then he's got <laughs> he's got someone up here getting ready to do like plain air painting outside and given the size of everything else they're doing a huge canvas too yeah it's, it's really cool i was just thinking of um uh, somebody reached out to me a while back and they were talking about how they found they they're asking if there's a better translation of apple seed because they read it and it doesn't make any sense and i was like nope you got the right <laughs> one <laughs> no it actually makes a lot of sense you just have to read it three times and have like uh some kind of background in philosophy <laughs> and maybe you just gotta study of... it for 30 years and <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's very dense i love this um the, the little iconography here of her thinking about the guy chasing her, this kind of cartoon monster face, and then the the light bulb on the panel below it. These two, yeah. And she's um she's like tasting the plaster. This <laughs> is a strange scene because like this this cat chick who like my impression of her, she's totally wild. She comes in and sees this guy in this art studio mixing up a uh, plaster to make a plaster cast. And then she like licks it and gets an idea. And then super far small in the background of, of this panel where he normally just puts like background jokes and stuff. You see them painting the plaster on here and uh, someone or or maybe this is just someone else that they're putting plaster on. I don't know, but she's complaining. I think someone else because some of this is like it tickles. She's like, stop that, just paint me. So, mm -hmm. like, obviously, he's getting a little fresh with her. Uh, but then you see that she has, like, to try and, like, kind of like Predator, where he puts the mud all over himself. She's yeah. putting plaster on herself to try and get not found by their sensors. Yeah, it's it's strange. Yeah, because it's almost like the Terminator scene where it goes into a room full of um, of statues. And maybe she was thinking that she was going to pose as a statue, but it doesn't really work out for her. Oh, that is a, like a combination of Terminator and Predator. Because in Predator, you have where Arnold smears the mud all over him to cool himself yeah. down to get past the heat. That's an interesting combo of the two. Real cool textures, though, that he's drawing. And then in here, they're talking about the bio. Her as a bioroid has a duty to humanity that they serve humans. Whereas in previous volumes, I kind of got the idea that they were like the ruling class that were making decisions and they're doing this hope plan to turn all the bio humans into bioroids. Right. I think this might be just, I think this is the character Fang, maybe his philosophy he's talking about because he's like a, a bioroid that works as a, as a, like a SWAT detective. Okay. Yeah, I got a little confused about that. But then there is this sense that, like, look, the bioroids were created to oversee humans, but they're supposed to view that as still a servile role. But it's a strange thing where the people who are serving you... Like, I was told by someone yesterday, this is fucking crazy, that uh, he, he talking to a guy that builds houses and does big architectural projects... He was involved in one trying to build on um, Native American land, some Navajo land to try and get them mm -hmm. better housing and stuff. And in the negotiating with the at the federal level to try and get funding for it, he was told that the Navajo people are wards, wards of the federal government. Strange. It, and that like it's the federal government's job to protect and look out for their interests which is like such a weird way to say like you're ours we control you and that that's how the bioroid thing starts to feel like to me is that they got put in this position to like serve and lead but with that is also like you're our wards like we're paternal we decide for you 
Interesting. And he seems to also be uncomfortable with that, as, as right. am I. <laughs> this is the scene where the, the page before is the scene where the guy who she shot with arrows dies, or is he's dying of poison? And I like this him yelling, uh, Fang yelling out, no dying without permission. Yep, don't do it, damn it. <laughs> we can revitalize your cellular functions. You'll pull through, don't give up. Right, and then he says, he like asks him permission to bypass something in his body. Oh, I'm going to inject you with something. And then, yeah, life extension. Oh, so he's going to give him a thing that will extend his life again. And right. you cannot terminate life extension without consent. Right. And then the, the human guy is like, you bastard, can't you tell the difference between uh, your partner and some kind of machine? And he just says, can you? Like, Which is a good, <laughs> a good question about the difference between robots and humans. If you can't tell the difference behaviorally, then that's the only, only uh, that's as much as you can ask about it. There's a park in Seattle called Freeway Park near where they have the Emerald City Convention. It looks very much like the city of Olympus. Well, goddamn, that sounds beautiful. That's lovely. <laughs> yeah, I've never seen anything like I've seen stuff like this more in like European or like very, very modern, like last 10, 15 years of architecture, but. This this seems very ahead of its time, <laughs> as is all Shiro work. Uh, sure. Something I noticed on here, very strange. They they basically talk about her as a white goddess, and it, it, like this this person's name is Artemis Al Alpia. Alpia was a white goddess, also known as Alpina, and many other names. And then they associate her with Artemis, the Greek goddess who protected things of nature. So mm -hmm. she's like this white goddess that protects nature is like what that character kind of summarizes. Um, and also is like showing something about hu humanity's wild side is in there. Uh, yeah, she can preserve and protect the wild side of human nature. So like, mm -hmm. hey, we're not going to... She holds the key to the solving Gaia's problems. Because Gaia is the AI in the previous one that's trying, right. they, they've put in, like, they've asked the AI to solve the problem of utopia, and it, it apparently isn't able to do it, and they're thinking that this one might be able to put some kind of data, give some kind of data to Gaia that could help her figure out how to incorporate the wild side of human nature into a right, utopia. If I remember right, basically humans are... They they predict that in Appleseed the humans are going to be able to stop are going to stop reproducing in a couple of generations. Yeah, because they're talking about cloning, uh, but they're also yeah they're they're saying that could close the loop and then that would be bad. So we need to have this gen genetic diversity. We need to have the wildness in there still. But they're also trying to move everyone over to being bioroids. So I don't know why they're particularly worried about preserving the wild side of human nature, unless they're trying to figure out a bioroid that can have that and not be this cold, rational only bioroid that they've got now, but not yeah, I cause just problems. To kind of keep the genetic diversity going. So they're, so they're able to reproduce, but, but somehow work out all of the negative psychological consequences of our wild side, which seems crazy to me. Yeah. It's a cool window on the top panel. This looks like Briar Rose's chest hair shirt from earlier. Some kind of patterns. Yeah. <laughs> I've styled my my office after Briar Rose's chest hair. <laughs> well, no, he was wearing that tunic that had the pattern that kind of looked like chest hair. Um, and then right here, they're training again. And I like that they have the one little one that they're not supposed to shoot. You know, it's a mm -hmm. victim because it says help on it. <laughs> and then they're blowing up the other two. Oh, yeah, that's a cool training thing. And then... And then they're kind of getting exhausted. And then he has to have the the um, the shiny screen tone thing where they all change afterwards. Yeah, because we got to go into the shower and yeah. Get I don't greasy. think that's how a SWAT shower <laughs> looks like. <laughs> you don't think? <laughs> it's wishful thinking on his on his part. And I think there's this is the part where there's like a lot. I think it's this part where they a guy's giving another guy advice on wearing boxers rather than briefs so his legs don't get too... Uh, too scratched up in the mech suits. Yeah, he's saying, damn it, my thighs are rubbed raw. I told you to wear boxer shorts. And then right here, they have a, 
a sign that says who dares wins and that looks like it's in his lettering oh yeah because that's that movie i was referencing yeah yeah it's the thing i like a lot that i mentioned before is he'll just he'll be like oh, i'm getting all these designs from this movie here's the name of the movie written on the wall well, it's it's the kind of the same instinct that makes him do all the notes. Like he wants to be as honest as possible. Yeah. There there's there is something scholarly about him, obviously, in the amount that he's read and consumed, but that that need to like make sure people get credit where credit's due is a very academic thing. Here's your like return, except he doesn't do her foot, but here's that panel pulled out of just the full figure again. Yeah, this is really making me want to try to work that into the next couple of pages I'm working on too, because he, he he makes it work so well in this. And I think is she wearing like a like a take a cop to bed t-shirt? Is that what it it says? Oh yeah, be secure all night, take a cop to bed. And then she's got like cute little panties with uh, hearts on it, and he gets to draw his little tight egg shaped buns again. <laughs> is do you think those are? The same shorts that she was wearing when she was in the the kind of cop cosplay earlier. This one, yeah, maybe I'd have to flip back. Yeah, it kind of does look like it. Yeah, which would be interesting because you rarely see like uh, clothes um, come back in that way. And and I really like the, the weird the weird sailor suit that the robot next page was. <laughs> this guy, he he's the one that looked like Cell from the earlier scene. Yeah, but yeah. No, I like the idea that they find him in a French in France, and they're like, this, "How does a French guy dress?" <laughs> Just like this, like that. <laughs> <laughs> or sorry, he's like Donald Duck. And they're reading Cyborgs of Fortune, so a magazine for uh, cyborg mercenaries, which is what they are. Oh, that's fantastic! I love that they have that's a trade amazing. magazine for that, <laughs> like Wizard Magazine for. Oh, here it is yeah. again. Yeah. That is and here's more of um yeah and and she feels very circus soleil in her outfit there too and this also feels very like later jojo stuff to me again that like oh, kind of sense so, of yeah. fashion the boxy hats and stuff yeah yeah he really allows himself to get away with some some weird stuff i really like that when Barrow rose gets off the helicopter here how he's got like bloody handprints all over him and she's like how are the riots and he's like work it's worse than ever it like implies this uh, whole other story that he doesn't show Oh yeah, he does have like splattered blood. Oh yeah, there's the handprints. At this point, I felt like just page wise, like like whatever was going on here, I thought I was gonna learn some more, and then we switched back to like just a training scene, and then kind of like I didn't think that the story was quite over yet. I felt like there right. was more to go with this, and then this all feels just like you know, the last five minutes of a movie where you show everyone getting back to normal life. Yeah, it's a little bit of an appendix. Yeah, and it was a little strange because I didn't quite feel that the cat girl story had finished properly. Mm -hmm. But if you're saying she shows up again, maybe there's more of a hint there. Yeah, I don't know if it does a lot. Yeah, it'll be interesting to, to revisit that. And then they have the funeral scene on the right. And there's something funny about his hair just sticking out of the... It's a little morbid, like humorously morbid. <laughs> yeah, and there's the funeral sign on the wall there. It's like death is just a new beginning. Death is but a new beginning. Yeah, and it has like a little, like almost looks like a like an alien, like with the alien head and the two big eyes and little hands. Yeah, you're you're just gonna go become a gray. Yeah, and then the bottom left panel there where the guys checking out the girl to kind of keep him in character. Yeah, like how are you supposed to track all that stuff? That's what I'm saying. Each each character in here has like their own kind of thread throughout the book, and they all they all interrelate to the theme. And mm -hmm. that's why people think that the translation is so bad, is because it's too hard to track it all at first. It's a lot going on. Yeah, it it reads um, you know, I I would often complain about how like superhero comics kind of dumb down readers because they kind of have this uniform way of like, this is how a comic is read, this is what you can expect from a comic. And I like that, aside from the nods that I've that I've mentioned about Chiro kind of pulling from Japanese girls comics of the 80s, it feels like he's like really has his own unique storytelling style that that doesn't seem I guess he's I mean he's pulling from film a little bit, obviously, but but it feels like he's kind of developed his own language. Which is very much reliant on the reader 
is smart. Like he's trusting them to be able to do maybe too much a lot of the times, or, you know, you really have to go back and re-explore it. That's why I keep bringing up that like trick where I don't even know if it's a trick for him, but I feel like I'm always kind of having to backtrack and then come back forward again. Uh, that seems to be an integral part of what he does. Mm -hmm. And, and that actually is kind of how the world works is you get into a situation where you don't have context and you got to figure it out. And we, we get rid of that in storytelling because it can make people feel the way this book made me feel the first time I read it. But I actually think it's much more natural. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, there's not, I, I'm always, it's interesting to think about like what you would suggest if somebody read Shiro's work and it's like, what else is like that? Like, I feel like there's not a lot that you could, you could. Uh, yeah, I, do, I don't, <laughs> I don't know. I'll, I'll have to, the other thing is like, I really feel the more I talk to you and the more we dig into these, uh, the more I start to read like Ghost in the Shell, um, I do see like a unified worldview that he's trying to approach from different angles in all of the books. And I'm really, before I can like really say, even answer a question, like what else is like Shiro? I feel like I need to read his whole body of work. And then what the is answer Shiro? is probably going to be, you can't, you can't match that. It's too. Yeah. It's interesting. When I was younger, I remember getting the impression that Shiro was, you know, I grew up in Seattle and I had the impression of reading Shiro stuff that he had a more, kind of right-wing view of the world but the older i get the more i think that he just has a very complicated and interesting view of the world i think it was just kind of the police aspect of it that gave me that impression yeah yeah and and there is a lot of where he is he is having characters explore authoritarianism as one of the like potential ways to create a utopia but also one of the problems with the utopia and that when that shows up, it, I think especially young people are just going to see that and nothing else because that's what they're yeah. worried about. Um, but I, yeah, I take him to be like if you put it in terms of American politics, my sense is a libertarian, which yeah, is now yeah, like right. now like a dirty word. You're like an alt right libertarian, you know, like the the stuff that but like right. in, in the true sense of what a libertarian is of of basically uh like a. A Robert Heinlein self-made man, essentially. Yeah, the competent outsider. Uh, I think that's what the show The Mandalorian's all about, too. Like, this is the way. They're constantly like, this is the way. Is like, cut your own fucking way through the path. That baby Yoda's going to be like half Jedi, half half Sith, you know? Like, it's pretty obvious that they're going for the middle path. And I uh -huh. think Sh Shiro is very much got there first. Um, while we're sitting here talking, I just noticed he's doing a shout out to MC Escher here with uh his his tessellating patterns that go from a fish oh, nice. to a bird huh that's so cool yeah just a little one um and, and that's actually now that i'm looking at that that's thematically right because it's like the yin yang thing it's like there's always the negative space to the positive mm -hmm. space which is a very zen thing like you don't have the cup without the space that the water goes into like right. that's the more important part of the cup is the the part that's not there. So that actually makes sense. Um, but then it's transforming to like the pattern warps. So it can change, but it it's interlocking and necess necessary to have both parts. Right. It's also worth noting that Shiro was pretty young when he did this stuff. It'd be really fascinating to see what he'd like if he did started doing narrative work again. I think he wrote a manga maybe a decade ago that was drawn by someone else, but but nothing on this scale. I can't imagine having this much knowledge this young to put together this picture of the world mm -hmm. and to make a decision like putting in Escher there, if that was instinctual or not, but it like, it's so easy for me to make sense of that. And he references right. so much stuff. Like how did you read all of that by the time you yeah, were, I remember early... right, he was working as a teacher in the early, in his early manga days too. Yeah. But how old was he when he made this stuff? I mean, I think he started Appleseed in his early mid twenties, if I remember right. Yeah, it's just insane. Like, I mean, yeah. I I was reading a lot of philosophy in my early to mid twenties, and none of none of this stuff would have made sense to me until the last ten years or so. Like, I it's just it's a sign. And then you add in that he's gained all these art skills too. Like, how do you have the time to get so good and so knowledgeable? It, it's just astonishing. Yeah, no, it's, it's interesting because they're. 
I was talking to someone the other day about how the word genius gets thrown around. And I think that, I think that Shiro is one of the rare people I could say, I think this guy's an artistic genius. Yeah. He's, he's just, it's, it, it's incomprehensible that someone was doing this so young, like the yeah. art, the art alone, there's plenty of artists that I, I see that come out the gate and they just got it right away. Whereas like, I'm still in my forties, like trying to get to the level, but so I could get that, but it's just the sheer amount that is in here. Uh, and he's obviously like thought through the mechanisms of everything too. It's not just the density of the philosophical thought. It's like his sure. technical explanation. That, when do you have the time to get that all in your head? Right. I don't know. It's, it's baffling. Yeah. He wasn't busy windsurfing. He was, he was just <laughs> writing and reading maybe. Yeah. Why. Maybe why he uh, calmed down on producing work and just does naked lady drawings now is he's he's maybe he's living a life in his sixties. What else could you do after you think you solve the world's problems and you put the message out there and you've completely burnt yourself out and exhausted yourself? It's like fuck it, you all figure it out. I'm gonna have fun. <laughs> like but it's fascinating in both Appleseed and Ghost in the Shell. It feels like he doesn't arrive at a conclusion like you think like Appleseed he literally like left the final book unfinished like it was published like half drawn and then yeah. he moved on to Ghost in the Shell and and he did Ghost in the Shell one and then he did a Ghost in the Shell two that then he decided wasn't Ghost in the Shell two and it was released as like a and another under another another title and the actual Ghost in the Shell two is is much worse so I feel like he's like it feels like these like almost like failed attempts at greatness that he that he succeeds on our level but he like like there's not like an ending to apple seed he failed on his own level i think part of that is because my own experience with all my deep dives into philosophy is that when you're young it's really easy to be like i've got it i've solved it and mm -hmm. then the more you work on so that that then tempts you to like let people know what you've solved <laughs> which is what i i feel like he's trying to do with these books i think he's also trying to think through the situation but i feel sure. like he has a pretty clear understanding ahead of time of what he's trying to say when, when you get down and you start writing it down it becomes much easier to see the flaws in your own argument Hmm. And that's the place where I think most like like a really honest philosopher, which he seems to be, is eventually going to drive themselves crazy because there's cracks in every argument. Mm -hmm. uh, there's oh, and, and he's dealing with that in some sense. You know, you can't have a perfect utopia. You can't have a perfect argument. And I could see someone like him who obviously like OCD cares about getting the details right. Eventually, his own system is going to collapse under its own weight in his head and at that point i can see him being like fuck it yeah like this i've been killing myself over this and yeah i still can't find my way out of it and i've gotten wise enough to know i'm never going to find my way out of it so quit stressing myself and get on to living a life yeah there's certainly some of that there. it's interesting he he's very he seems very, very self it might just be kind of a japanese politeness but he seems very self-deprecating in his art book when he talks about things he'll always point out the flaws in his work and things like that it made me think of like years ago um i was hanging out with the with james jean he's a really fantastic artist and he was being self-deprecating in a way and i remember pointing out like Ooh. oh but your work is doing so much better than this this and he had this like kind of moment of clarity and talking about being self-deprecating is like oh no i'm better than all those people i'm just not up to my own standards yeah because james jeans james jean is at the tippy tippy top of all of it um yeah, and, so, and so is shiro yeah it's got to be an interesting place to be and especially shiro being um in the manga scene and really having his own lane yeah um it, it's got to be a very bizarre place to be in well, and imagine James Jean is applying that just to the, you know, what whatever he's thinking about visually primarily. Mm -hmm. Shiro's doing that also with what appears to me to be a very passionate and earnest need to like fix a problem that he sees or try and describe it. And so the stakes yeah. are even higher for seeing cracks in his own work. Certainly. You know, and, and if he has that personality where he's, like it sounds to me based on the art book that he is his own worst critic 
and apply that to the art fine but when you start applying that to your view of reality and you you start seeing cracks everywhere which a mind like that would like i always tell sure. people i feel like my greatest superpower is like karnak i can see the flaw in everything and so i have a really hard uh -huh. time I, I, ha I have all my opinions and I know what they are, but I have a really hard time putting them down in writing and stuff because I'll immediately start seeing the flaws and, and it's, it's very stressful. So I kind of feel sympathetic for him from a, you know, like he's way up here, genius. And I'm down here with the most mild experience of what he must have dealt with. Yeah. It's funny. I remember years ago, uh, meeting an artist whose work was just absolutely exceptional. This guy, Memos Diaz. And I had this, um, I had this reaction of almost of uh, of almost calm looking through his his portfolio because I was like, oh, I'm glad I'm not this good. That would be stressful. Yeah, every time you get better too. I don't know if you've experienced this, but you really feel like you took a leap forward. There's always a oh shit, I set a precedent that I have to live up to now. Like I can't dip back down below this. Like, yeah, I've achieved a level and. Fuck. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it is really hard. Something that happens to me a lot is all is is when you get known for, um, you know, like I did a thing years ago in my King City book where I have like a two page spread that's a um, that's a board game that's full of all these jokes yeah. and puns and everything, and that was kind of what I became known for for a while. And just recently, I did a job where where I was doing a three page comic, and my friend that I was doing it for was like, "Do that thing," and I was like, "I'm not doing that thing ever again." <laughs> Yeah, no, like hell no. But but that is like that. That's a page where if I if I were you making that page back when you made it with the density of detail and all the jokes and stuff, my brain would immediately have said. I'm so fucking proud of this. Oh, shit. Now I have to be this good every time like that. I've had that experience a number of times. Yeah, but I do think that that a cool thing about being an artist is you have to find different directions too. Like you can, you know, like I think Mobius taught us the thing of like with his adenocycle, it's like he he went forward by scaling back and having this like really clear line, simple style to so he could pare things down as much as possible. And you can, I, I think just kind of, you know, turning around and going different directions with your art is really helpful. And maybe even with your philosophy, like it would be helpful if Shiro just tried to pare things down and had to, to try to tell a simple story it might be harder for him and more impressive. Maybe that's what he's doing with all the porno stuff is like, that's his answer at the end is like, reproduce, enjoy sex, have fun. <laughs> like I'm simpling it down people. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. It's just like, I he's trying to just live long and take, take long baths and eat apricots and things. And hang out at the H2O club. Yeah. Oh, that's a great uh, place. I love this, this Hitomi and Dunan contrast panel. Um, something I was right talking, here. I was talking with some friends recently about the idea of, uh, um, I went to dinner with J.H. Williams yesterday and we were talking about the idea of um, how a lot of writers get on this kick of like, you got to make this character speak totally different than this character. But if two characters are in the same environment and grew up together, then they might not necessarily have different dialects, different different speech. So you show the characters being different through their actions. And I feel like this is a really cool single image of, of Dune and Hitomi that's just like, you know, it's just obviously she's stronger than her, but it's like, it's like these are this is why these two characters are are different physically. Yeah, and and um like their reactions to it, like you like that wraps into her job versus her job. Her job is to be like the softener. Right. Yeah. She's supposed to soften the blow. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and then before we we flip on, like we're talking about how he doesn't really come to a conclusion with the series as a whole. But I do feel like on this one, the scales of Prometheus, he gets to the point he was trying to make the whole time at the end is um, Briar Rose here is just telling Dune in about, you know, some other some other training she's going to have to do and things like that. Mm -hmm. And She's like, why didn't you tell me that sooner? And he said, if, if you don't learn some flexibility, learn to team up with anyone, you'll have to someday. It, if you don't learn that, you'll wind up dead meat. And, well, I'm just so sorry. And then he says, we're balanced scales. That's what we are. And, and he's pointing out that between the two of them, uh, mm -hmm. they balance each other's scales. And, like, really, that's 
I, I think my relationship with Tori, that's, I feel like that's why we work so well as we balance each other. I watch my parents. I, I'm assuming like most healthy long-term relationships are the balance yeah. scales. And, and in there, that's the final message of the book is that uh, it, it is like the, the pro diversity. You have to find how to get along with other people and, you mm -hmm. know, not be the dune in. Um, so I think sure. this actually seemed like to me, maybe only because I read it, maybe just because I've read it three times, it seemed like thematically the most straightforward of all of them, where I feel like I really understood what his answer was, whereas you and Sean kind of had to convince me of an answer on volume two. Okay, yeah, because volume two seems like a simple like a simple a, a more simple kind of storyline and it's just like you've got like you know the computer that the they've got to stop with the apple seed you know this one feels like he's more um i definitely i think this is this might be my favorite of all the apple seed books well it, it there was still a really like complex philosophical argument in the other one even though there was like the there wasn't as many plot threads going Sure. I just didn't feel as con I wasn't so convinced by the end of it of what I thought exactly because he was asking a lot of questions and seemed to be promising an answer. And I wasn't sure what his answer was until and you and Sean convinced me of it. I think in this one, even though there's more complexity in the plot threads and stuff, he actually like shows all the sides of the thematic thing more successfully and then yeah. actually comes to some more easily understood conclusion. Yeah, and this this one has less like kind of old men sitting on floating orbs talking about the the problem of, of society. This one shows more like it's more of like a a showing how things work out rather than than telling it. And, well, and, more, and also what did that page layout? It, in, instead of old men, he just gave you a bunch of shower scenes with crotch shots when people got philosophical. <laughs> like that's how he solved that problem. Here yeah. you've got him doing his it's trick twice. Yeah, yeah, this is it's a really cool scene too, just showing her like getting into the gugs and all the inside mechanism. And this is like a premonition of things to come for what he wanted to really draw was crotch shots it is on robots. Cause his his early work, like if you look at like the early Appleseed books, I feel like he like is really almost seems kind of timid about sexuality, like the shower scene and and some of the early issues and things, but like. By the time he gets to this, it's like you, you see a kind of awakening in him. His yeah. kind of Lenara is, is like coming to fruition. Well, and I mean, maybe that's part of it, too, is he was just so much into all of the research and reading and thinking that obviously had to go into building all of these stories. Now he's he's been able to start getting some of them out and he's obviously gaining fame. Like maybe he just literally had that experience in his life where he wasn't paying attention to anything other than this and then as sure. this started to move out of the way his his sexual interests and stuff could start to manifest a little bit more easily at puberty yeah it's something really interesting about shiro that i was just thinking about is for someone who's such a technically impressive artist he's he does really simplified feet and hands i you know i was looking at that because i, I think you mentioned that in the the lost video in mm -hmm. the lost video um, I was looking at that and I feel like he actually has really sophisticated hands. Like the gestures are pretty sensitive. He doesn't do a lot of detail in them, but like the way these two fingers are up and those two are down and then her fingers out like on the arrow. Um, I, I feel like he's doing a lot of actually pretty complex, expressive things with the hands. Uh, I wasn't. They're, not, they're not bad at all. It's just it is kind of they're not as they just don't feel as like, um, like I feel like there's other artists that draw hands and feet much better than Shiro, but everything kind of works with his stuff. So it almost, you know, it almost feels like a D and D chart where he's rolled <laughs> the hands and feet lower than his, than his other skills. Yeah, maybe like, cause here I can see what you're talking about. These are pretty simple hands, but I, I don't only know. say like, that. I feel like that's who, pretty good. good at drawing. Like my hands and feet are not, particularly strong in my work either so i can look at this and be like oh good shiro who i think of as like the top top is like also not super focused on on getting those perfect yeah well, i mean he's got so much else he's he's juggling that makes sense yeah there's a um european comic i think eros translated called the blonde and it's a guy who clearly is like is like got some kind of sexualization of feet and <laughs> and 
I'm always like looking at that being like, I, I wish I had a, I wish I had weirder sex feelings about feet so I get better drawing them. <laughs> that's, an, that's an interesting idea that uh, you, you may want to cultivate a fetish to get better at drawing a thing. Yeah, but it would also like make your personal life weirder and worse. But but think about how good you draw. Maybe more interesting. Yeah, yeah, don't, maybe. Don't maybe be so judgy, Brandon. Maybe it's not true. weirder and worse. Maybe it's yeah. cooler. And <laughs> no, it's um, funny too. Just like maybe that's a funny aside. But I was thinking with people's impression of you through your work because I do a lot of sexualized images, and I'll meet people who are just like like really into like let's talk about how you draw this part of sexy ladies and it's always like oh i published that publicly weird and now we gotta talk about with strangers <laughs> well it's pretty obvious that you share shiro's affinity for butts but it, it seems like he he likes them a little tighter <laughs> oh yeah but, yeah he's a, I, I prefer hips yeah like that's the only thing i would see in your work whether that like was really obvious to me but i've never thought about that me and tori are talking about doing uh the a pornographic book or an erotic book oh cool um ba based on like a lot of the not not autobiographical but deep deeply autobiographical in the sense would be based on everything we've gone through with her illness and and like how right. that's impacted our our life um I've, I've never thought about doing that kind of content in comics before just personally, that was never an interest of mine. But now I've been thinking about it a lot. Like how 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 would I do it in a way that like would wouldn't get me into those situations where it doesn't seem to be based on the fetishes and that kind yeah. of stuff, but it's it's based really on the the relationship and that being yeah, part the of the relationship. Of that. that sounds good. And I I feel like that's a especially cool thing about the medium of comics is you could do something really personal and especially with that subject, do something really personal and and have it be such a niche thing where other people would be like, you know, ideally find the book and be like, I didn't know anyone else had these thoughts that, you know, was going through this thing. Yeah. And like, I feel, I mean, like I said, I would never do it as autobiography. I would couch it in a story still because I sure. always appreciate that better. But obviously anyone who knows what we've been going through would be like, yeah, this, this is probably all pretty pretty yeah, based yeah. in reality the, the quote give a man a mask and he'll tell you the truth it, it helps a lot when you couch like it, it it kind of is a little freeing to couch in the story because you're like now i can really talk about this and and rather than sticking to reality i can say i can express what the feelings are rather than the the exact experiences yeah and even probably like some things would be like this is exactly how it happened but we don't have to draw ourselves you know like that's another thing when you're <laughs> like you don't want to draw yourselves in, in those situations. get to draw ronald mcdonald and mayor mccheese in the scenes instead of you <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's that's you what our want. book's gonna be it's gonna be about ronald mcdonald and mayor mccheese uh as their relationship goes through the struggles of mayor mccheese becoming disabled <laughs> mm. too much cheese is my theory <laughs> yeah yeah that will get you um anyways dude thanks we i I think we we did three and a half hours here. Nice. I'm I'm amazed that we made it through, and and especially if anyone else made it through with us, then then congratulations. Yeah, if you made it through, hopefully I've split this up into like two videos or something. But um, we've we've got through three apple seeds. I think we need to jump into apple seed four, and then we can get back to going through Ghost in the Shell, probably a chapter at a time because it's so goddamn dense. And then you, Brandon's been sending me Dominion and he's going to be sending me some Orion as well. So hopefully we'll have a pretty complete, like I'll, maybe I'll have to try and find the art books and stuff too. And we can do a real thorough analysis by the time we're done. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah. And I, I feel like it it's really bolsters my enthusiasm about comics to, to go through this stuff and remember why Shiro stuff is so fantastic and what got you like lit up as a teenager yeah and also your take on things has been really cool because i feel like you're coming at it from such an intellectual level when you go through the pages i'm always like look at the cool way he drew the gun here and you're like well the philosophy here he's talking about is actually <laughs> this. And I'm like, yeah that happens. is that is my approach that's why it's a good balance but you're also like all the details and stuff that i'm missing because my while I'm looking at it, I'm off in that headspace, right? And so I'm missing like Briar Rose's little eye going around the corner. And sure. Um that's all that's all a credit to Shiro that you could take away such completely different things and still feel like you had a full experience. Yeah, certainly. Well, thank you all for joining us and uh we hope to see you for some more Shiro stuff eventually. <laughs>
Back to the land.